happened to me when I was in grade five was I read a poem, and I felt like someone had stolen the words that were in my head, except said them much better than I could ever possibly say. And that poet was Shel Silverstein. Does anyone know Shel Silverstein? So, yeah, so, so I blame him. <laughs> okay, so to me, what happened when he stole the words right out of my grade five brain and put them into his book was that I, I learned that poetry was the great connector. Poetry connects us. It allows us to understand and access really deep feelings and to be able to put them into words. Because ultimately, poetry is the way that we reveal ourselves to ourselves. That uh, poetry is, it is the expression of the feels that we feel before they have words. And then they come out, those feels, they come out as words. And, that, and that's what poetry does. Uh, my friend Tom Wayman, he says, well, poetry is an agent of social change. And the reason that he believes that poetry is an agent of social change is because it has no value in the money economy. I mean, ultimately, if you say to someone, would you mind if I read you my poem? Yeah, gotta go. <laughs> right? There's almost nothing else that can uh, make people run away quite as fast. So now that you're all <laughs> captively buckled into your seats, <laughs> I guess I've got you now, don't I? So uh, these, uh, one of the things that I think about in my poetry, um, I don't know if Raheem mentioned, but at the moment, I'm the current poet laureate of Calgary as well. So uh, one of the things that I think about in terms of my own poetry is, what is it like to be human? And not just what is it like to be human at the ground level, but from way up. So these are the things that I like to consider in my poems. And so I'm here to read a little bit to you. And uh, this giant clock that's as big as my torso is looking at me right here. So I will be mindful of your time. <laughs> this first poem. We heard some of these themes today, so it's really wonderful. It's called Convergence. Convergence. The long strand of my DNA casts its blood shape back to snow. A spattered deer kill the struck life narrowing to strips of pemmican in some voyager's pouch. Somewhere else, my DNA sits near the beach of Loch Lomond, watches ice flows in an afternoon light a fire with chill spark and halo. Yet another strand of DNA plants wheat and lilac near troglodyte caves, evening indigo high in the stratosphere peppered with faraway suns, reproducing lustrous blossoms below. Tiny epiphanies ladder, double-stranded ascensions to past and sky. This is to say my life is a hallway between these strands. This is to say no one is defined by space or time. This is to say I declare my citizenship to the sun. Light travels 150 kilo million kilometers without bias or prejudice or ownership of anywhere or anyone. This next poem is called If You. I'm really appreciative that Robert Thirsk is going after me because I write poems about spacey things and he, he's just an astronaut, so it's wonderful. If you, <laughs> if you, if you gaze at the stars, they turn their fiery irises towards our wet, dirty planet and watch the tidal motion of person piercing person with penis and gladius and bullet. A supergiant's own combustion sparks light, honesty. And we chalk compassion on blackboards and speak it from pulpits without much permanence, for, without much purchase for permanence. If you speak, remember speech is the symbolic act of a reasonable citizen. The white star turns back to itself silent when faced with this glut of gibberish and babble. The heart is dense with so much bad news. 
If you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back and the stars too, but then they must blink, turn away, indifferent. They must, having no hands to help or to heal. This next poem is about story, because I think that there are always more than one way to tell a story. So Somerset Mom, he's reading Proust in the desert. He's reading, and then he does this strange thing. He pulls the pages out of the book and flings them to the wind and the sand and the camels, and another man comes along, maybe the next day or a week after, I'm not sure which. And he picks up the pages, which aren't really a story anymore, more like the impression of a story with all the same words and similar cadences and all the same characters. But everything is wind-tossed and rearranged, enormous leaps of strangeness, and he finds them half-buried in a dune or crumpled deep in a camel's hoofprint. But each page is still art. Language flies its way into his hair, and he can't get it off of his head. It's solve a lover's breast, pleasurable. Water lilies after all that sand. Both men are equally satisfied with this experience, this way of reading. The man on the horse with his book all in order, like a map or a plan. And the man behind, He's making his own footsteps in the dune. He's making his way through it, too, but not the way it was intended. And which is the best experience? I don't know which man I'd rather be. Which one is the best story? And this is titled, I Always Wanted a Tattoo. This is for the real poetry geeks out there I like to teach this form in my class, so now you're going to get a poetry lesson today because you're still buckled in your seats. This poem is called a glossa. So what you do is you take four lines from a different author, and you respond to those lines, and those lines become embedded in the poem. So I'm going to read to you the four lines from the other author, and then you're going to hear them come back up. Okay. So the four lines are from Mary Rufel. She's an American poet. She says this. In the end, I would rather wonder than know. I never got my tattoo and never will. I hesitated too long in the time in which acquire such things has passed, as all things will. So here comes the response. I always wanted a tattoo of a flock of birds winding up around my hip and across my belly and over my shoulder and between my breasts and up my neck like a spiral or a corkscrew. I saw a hummingbird chase a squirrel in a pine tree up that path, a skirmish with beak or claw, tooth versus wing, a tiff that came to no blood, just the chatter and squawk of two fools marking territory in space big enough to hold them both. In the end, I would rather wonder than know where the territory lines stop and start and live reckless by crossing those paradoxical borders of earth, water, and air. Have you ever leaned down into the sand and squinted at a shoreline eye to eye? It's not a line, but a shimmer, a wave, a blur, impossible to ink with damselfly or magnum needle, enduring without permanence or stasis. Borders shift and move, world, I never got my tattoo and never will. I admire the tree, its certainty of freedom belonging to neither bird nor mammal, no citizenship to blood. Life rocks on past this feeble quibble, for what is it to attach to the small dramas of one season's nesting beasts? Much more comes in the letting and the going. Roots keep on rooting and cone keeps on seeding. I hesitated too long, and the time in which one acquires such wisdom has already cost me half my life. 
Entropy claims the natural order of things. Tree is the best mentor. But even a trunk turns to driftwood in time. I've already talked myself out of a tattoo. Indelibly marking myself no longer matters. Always isn't real to me. Wanting is now about contentment, essentials. Now I simply notice things pass, as all things will. And this last one is called, I Bet You Already Knew. And I'm going to dedicate this to my mother who came and supported me for the last six weeks while I went insane, <laughs> preparing for this talk. I bet you already knew. I broke up once, like mercury dispersed, bearings out from the mother drop, a solid thing diffused, not quite whole, an elegant biology of molecules orbited out from the center of the thing called self, called existence. It happened at a lake. I paddled to the horizon between glacial scour and outer space, I faced up, or was it down? Either way promised an untouchable infinity. There is something to be said for that kind of silence. I floated until my mind was empty of human words, until it existed in feel, only in feel, beyond the abilities of this poem, its inept syllables, until I knew my own smallness in the universe. Then came the tingling, the dispersal, the love. Not the love of a man or a woman or a mother or a father, but the love, the big thing, the big other, maybe infinity. But let's not rush to name it. Let's not spoil it with that. You know what I mean. Cells peeled one by one like electrons off a nucleus separate but held the space between the ancients called ether quintessence, a highway for light and gravity. And at the center was a ball of white, a fifth element, and all the things I had ever done badly or wrong didn't matter. But the feel concentrated, intensified, a storm of stillness, an explosion simultaneous beyond body, beyond self. Do I explain this thing, this coming apart as oneness? Does that make sense? Are you still with me after all of this otherworldly talk? Time unhinged was unknown. The feel lasted for maybe a second, maybe an afternoon. Does it matter how long? What matters is that it happened at all, and somehow it has become infinite, for I can recall it now, that burst. And have you ever felt like that, when nothing and everything matters but love? <laughs>